Thank you all for joining us here today. It's, it's such a pleasure for me to have such a wonderful set of speakers and, uh, and a group of attendees um, to, to discuss this, this quite important topic of taxation today. My name is David Alzate. I am a senior policy associate over at JPAL Global, where I manage the governance initiative. And it is the pleasure of the governance initiative to host this event along with our colleagues of JPAL's Crime and Violence Initiative and IPA's Peace and Recovery Program. Today's webinar on building state capacity for tax collection is the fourth in a series of webinars sharing emerging insights from our research network over at IPA and JPAL to improve the evidence base on governance, crime, and conflict over the past three years. Our previous webinars in this series, which we began a few months ago, discuss insights from interventions aimed at improving social cohesion, combating violence against women through state institutions and strengthening dispute resolution systems. So I'll ask my colleagues to throw the links to the, to the recordings of these webinars uh, in the chat for those of you who might be interested. We'll keep you all posted about future webinars in the series, but we're very happy to discuss the topic at hand today uh, and to have all of you here joining us. Before getting into the conversation and starting it, I wanted to provide a bit of background about the motivation behind this webinar series. Together, JPAL's Governance Initiative, JPAL's Crime and Violence Initiative, and IPA's Peace and Recovery Program form the Joint Governance, Crime, and Conflict Initiative, and that's what the GCCI acronym stands for. And this is supported by the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Office. Since 2017, GCCI has funded rigorous and policy-relevant research to determine what works and also what does not work to improve governance and reduce crime, violence, and conflict in low- and middle-income countries. The vast majority of the research that we support on the GCCI makes use of randomized evaluations or RCT as their main methodology. And this research also aims to answer fundamental questions about topics in governance, crime and conflict, whose answers can provide generalizable insights to inform programming and practice in a variety of contexts, not just the ones where the research was originally implemented. The purpose of this webinar series then is to share some insights from studies in the GCCI network and to go beyond the academic sphere to provide actionable policy recommendations for you members of the audience. To date, we have funded over 90 randomized evaluations in almost 40 countries depicted in the slide here. And today we are going to focus on a subset of these studies, specifically addressing challenges inside one country, but challenges that are common to many and that deal with a very important research and policy question. And that is, how can states build the capacity for tax collection? In particular, what are effective domestic resource mobilization strategies for states with limited tax capacity and where tax collection is quite low? These challenges are timely and complex even in normal times as they involve multiple factors related to state capacity for tax collection, state capacity for public service delivery, informal economies, firms and citizens knowledge and their beliefs about paying taxes. And these challenges are arguably even more pressing today given the tight budgets faced by many governments under the COVID-19 pandemic. So, our purpose for today is not to provide a comprehensive and general answer to these many complex questions on taxation, but rather we'll share concrete and policy relevant insights from rigorous research on taxation conducted in one setting, that is the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also discuss the extent to which these insights might be generalizable and common to other settings. So we're very lucky to have five panelists who are deeply immersed in this question from across different perspectives. Dina Pomerans is an assistant professor of applied economics at the University of Zurich and a JPAL affiliate. She will provide an overview of the literature on taxation in low capacity settings. Jonathan Regal is an assistant professor in the Department of International Development at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He will be the first of three speakers today to present findings from randomized evaluations supported by GCCI and others that take place in the Democratic Republic of Congo, starting with an evaluation titled the participation dividend of taxation, how citizens in Congo engage more with the state when it tries to tax them. Gabriel Turek is a postdoctoral associate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a colleague at JPL Global. He will continue the conversation on results from rigorous research in the Democratic Republic of Congo and share evidence from the randomized evaluation, local elites as state capacity, how city chiefs use local information to increase tax compliance in the DR Congo. Agustin Bergeron is a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford King Center on Global Development, currently wrapping up his PhD at Harvard. He will discuss the results of the GCCI funded randomized evaluation, the state capacity ceiling on tax rates, evidence from randomized tax abatements in the DRC. 
Marina Mavungu Ngoma is a PhD candidate in economics and public policy at Tufts University with a focus on structural transformation, burns, and misallocation. She previously worked on issues of agricultural and rural development for the Office of the Prime Minister in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She will be our final panelist and speak to how these results can be interpreted and applied in practice. So we're eager to get the conversation started, but before a few housekeeping notes for the audience, we will start with presentations from each panelist and then open the floor to questions from the audience. We would love to hear from you. And if you'd like to ask a question during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function within the Zoom settings. And share your name and affiliation if you're comfortable so our panelists know who the question is coming from. Feel free to ask questions throughout the event, but we will not get to answering them until the end. We may not be able to answer all questions, so we apologize for this in advance. Finally, I'll note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch after the event is over. We appreciate members of the audience sharing the link with any colleagues you think might be interested in these topics, but they could not join us here today. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to our wonderful panelists to get started, beginning with Dina Palmerens. Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this exciting panel. Uh, let me share my slides. Um, great, so it's an honor and privilege to be able to uh, introduce this uh, amazing set of papers and the amazing set of speakers. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit with uh, about taxation, why should we care? Um, it's, I know this often, I tell people that I study uh, economics in low and middle income countries and then they are very excited and then they tell, I tell them that I study taxes and then their face drops and they're like, who cares, <laughs> taxes? Uh, we have all these pressing needs related to poverty and undernourishment and education and now COVID. How, why should I care about taxes? Yeah, but if you care about these topics, my, I want to convince you that you should care exactly because you care about these topics, you should care about taxes because no modern state really can exist in the long run without effective taxation. If you think about investments needed for all these issues that I just mentioned, uh, as well as assuring you know, security and basic infrastructure, uh, that the state needs money for all of that. In addition, when there's a lot of distortion, uh, a lot of <clears throat> tax evasion, there could be big distortions in the economy because a few activities get taxed very highly, while other activities that escape taxation through evasion uh, do not, and that can actually really hurt uh, economic development. And also a lot of countries uh, want to reduce their dependence on foreign aid and therefore foreign power and, and for all these reasons a building local state capacity is really important so strengthening state capacity and the ability to effectively and fairly collect taxes is a key priority for many if not most governments around the world and there's a growing academic literature that's sort of coming a bit late to the game but it's also focusing on these questions and we try to write a little bit of an overview of the state of some of that literature in an annual review paper together with Jose Villabelda a couple of years ago um, so very big picture, if you look at the world map and see what is the uh, tax collection as a share of GDP, we see that there's very, very big differences. And while it's not one to one, we can see that it tends to be higher in higher income countries, which means that low income countries have doubly very low funding for the state. On the one hand, it's a smaller share of GDP. And on the other hand, GDP is much smaller. Right. And so uh the, the resources that the state like the drc has available to build all these amazing things that we just mentioned on the previous slides are extremely limited you know sometimes you have a, a you know an entire country has less government resources than large u.s cities for example and so and so it, you know it, it's a very very basic uh, funding that is that is uh, very scarce um so it, it's really not that easy. So, you know, uh, to, to increase tax collection. Uh, often we talk about limited capacity, but it's, it's really also just much harder uh, to tax in a low, in a low, tax, low income country context. So I work a lot with tax authorities in, in several different countries and I, I find people are extremely high capacity actually, um, but it's just really hard. So, for example, there's limited information that the government has about what are actually taxable assets and activities. And so if the government doesn't have proof that you have uh, an income or an asset, it's much harder for the government to then uh, force you to make a payment. 
because there's a large informal sector. And even the formal sector is hard to tax. There's lack of paper trails and, and documentation. And so it's much harder for the government to even know where to collect taxes. And then this small tax base leads to potentially very high tax on a small number of firms or, or people. And th then you also don't want to enforce like very strongly on a small number of people. And then it, it can create really injustice in society and also distortions in the economy. And welfare distribution is really complex. So it's political economy often is very high to tax the few people who are relatively rich. And then you have the risk of making the very poor people even poorer. And in low-income countries, the vast majority of people are very poor. And so you get into really difficult issues of distribution and welfare when you want to enforce taxes more. So you want to enforce taxes more to have money to pay for the poor, but where you take the money from, also from the poor. So it, it gets, it's really, really a difficult, difficult challenge. Um, but many people don't know that this challenge is not that long ago that all the rich countries were in a similar situation. So this idea of high taxes is actually very recent. This modern state that does all these things is very recent. The state didn't used to do these things in today's rich countries just a hundred years ago either. And so you, know, you can see that all these rich countries have increased their tax collection over recent decades or you know, the last century. And, and the many low-income countries are now starting a similar trajectory. Uh, taxes though, they play a really important role. So in middle-income countries, they are much, much larger than international aid, for example but also about then, then, then for direct investment or remittances for migrants. Uh, but even in low-income countries, you know, the aid is now a higher part of their uh, foes, but it's similar in, in the magnitude taxes. So taxes are, play a very important role, uh, for, even in the poorest country. But there's a very big scarcity of academic research focusing on these low-income countries. And that's why in part, I'm so excited about these set of papers. Uh, traditionally, most economics research has focused on taxation just in rich countries, uh, predominantly actually in one rich country, the United States of America. Uh, in more recent years, there's been a growing literature on taxation in developing countries and on tax capacity and tax compliance as a topic, also in rich countries. But this has focused, including my own research, heavily on middle income countries, uh, and even within African countries, on the higher income countries within Africa, very little research on lower income countries and fragile states. Um, so, so, so in economics in general, you know, the principle of St. Matthews uh, also applies that those who already have more, uh, more will be given. Those who have more resources will do more studies and help them to get even more resources. And so I think in economics, we really need to work on that, that, that inequality in research. So, so there's lots of, pioneering elements uh, in the nature and the importance of the research that is uh, being presented today, uh, in addition to just being in a setting that's really understudied by academic economies. Uh, they address really big old questions of political economy and taxation that economics has so far been unable to answer in a convincing way. Uh, and it's based on a deep collaboration between experts from academia with experts from practice in tax administration. I think really that's the best research you know, if we just sit in an office, especially if we're sitting in an office in the United States or in England, studying the DRC even more so, but in general, as economists, if we don't leave the office, we miss a lot of expertise that actually exists in the world. And this team has really worked very, very closely with the practitioners and with the experts uh, from the DRC. And as you will see, they wouldn't have come up even with these research questions a lot of the times without that those um, collaborations and then in the implementation, uh, every step along the way, you can see that it's a very deep collaboration. And the research really pushes the boundaries by bringing together many different trends in development economics, that each of them are kind of exciting. And these papers have all of them. So that's like what always blows me away. So this, this you know, in-depth field work, and then they use administrative data, which is, you know, it's not new, but it's more recent that there it even exists so much that we use it. They combine it with survey evidence. They combine it with actually observed behavior by people. So, you know, people say something, but do they actually do what they say? Can we see that they really change the behavior? And they use solid causal inference methods and do really detailed work to test the hypothesis on the underlying mechanism. So as you will see, they're not just saying this happens, but they try to really understand why and who exactly, and where's the lever? 
And so that's like, you know, uh, really pushing the boundaries of what a development economics paper can do. So I'm gonna give a very brief overview of the three papers. So the first paper called the Participation Dividend of Taxation answers a very old historical claim that I actually heard about it in undergraduate history lessons. And uh, where they said that uh, in, in Europe, you know, raising taxes strengthened the social contract between citizens and the state, and therefore played an important role in state building in, in Europe. And but it's a hypothesis. We have historical documentation, but 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 really uh, an empirical test of it. Uh, I, I, at least I'm not aware. And this paper not only documents the mechanism, but it also fleshes out in an impressive, if amounts. Uh, of nuance, the specificity of exactly how it happens. And since this question affects specifically in countries where the bond between citizens and the state is weak, and as I mentioned, that's exactly the places where economists usually don't go, uh, this question was rarely tested empirically so far. The second paper is one where you really see this close collaboration with the local experts uh, and the, the, the researchers from abroad, because it studies how local elites can uh, have state capacity or save a state capacity and uh, using the chiefs um, to increase tax compliance. So they analyze how the modern state can work together with traditional governments and power structure in an effective way to gain information and enforce, enforce tax compliance. The results show that engaging local chiefs to collect taxes uh, and to provide tax agents from the modern state uh, with information, it can substantially boost tax compliance. And then in the last uh, paper, they look at uh, what economists call the Laffer curve and how that interacts with state capacity. So a key challenge in low-income contexts uh, with large tax evasion is that evasion can increase when you increase the tax rate. So you try to collect more taxes, people evade more, right? And so it's this chase chasing. And they find that actually raising the tax rate can lower tax collection because people evade so much more. Um, the weaker tax enforcement, they find the stronger this effect. So when enforcement is higher, a higher tax rate can be applied before revenues start falling. So you can't really just increase tax collection by ramping up the tax rate if you don't also increase the tax capacity or the tax enforcement in parallel. And they find that this dynamic is mostly driven by taxpayers who are already very poor, highlighting this tension between forcefully collecting taxes, but then poverty alleviation at the same time. And, and to what extent do we really think that's a good idea? So David also asked me to add a few avenues and reflections for potentially you know, future directions for research. And I think one area, there are many, but one area that I think as economists, we haven't really addressed enough is exactly this tension. So what are the trade-offs between <clears throat> strengthening tax capacity and poverty reduction? Uh, in, in a country where scarcity is just the name of the game for everything, there's not enough for anything, for anyone, and, and how do you then handle this? What is the incidence of this type of tax collection activities on the poor? Do people go hungry because if they have to pay taxes, then they'd be really concerned, right? Uh, how progressive or regressive is the tax collection? So with the political economy there, do we end up taxing more the poorer? And what could we do to actually tax more the richer, which is what we're trying to do, at least in rich countries? And what is the impact of taxation on firm and economic development? If the firms are already struggling and then you tax them, are they going bankrupt? And then, and then we're killing the economy by trying to help help the economy. So, so these are really important questions that I think we haven't paid, paid so much attention to yet. And then in the very bigger picture, and this is not a critique of the authors, but really of my own field of study. It's like economics needs to become more inclusive. So we need to, first of all, expand economics research in low-income countries more. So I did recently this analysis. Currently, 80% of economic research is about the 20% of the world with the highest incomes. That's just off. Like, like way off, right? And the lowest income countries are the most underrepresented in this. So there's so much to learn and, and, and the impact will be so much greater if we focus more on the lower income countries. And then the second thing is about the research teams. And then and I say this because I know that the authors, which you will see are white males, <laughs> will actually agree that we want to make this a picture of the past. 
that we will not want to have in future that we have research teams that look like this when we're studying countries like the DRC. And so this is also myself, I'm, I'm saying this to myself too. I have papers where the single authored or, or author with other people who are foreigners and let's make research teams without representation from the country to study a thing of the past. In the same way we wouldn't have nowadays anymore a panel about you know reproductive health or abortion without a woman. And this was normal a few decades ago. I, we shouldn't have that happening anymore in economics about, about any, any topic uh, when it comes to studying uh, countries where the researchers are not from. So this I think is, is, is sort of a call for, for our whole discipline, including myself, that we have work to do in this area. Um, but, but I'm very excited. These authors at least are working very closely with the local experts and it's a, it's a very equitable process, but I think it does not read re reflected obviously in the, in the co-authorship and um, uh, yes, and I have similar problems myself and I'm, I'm, I'm telling this to myself just as much. So I'm looking forward to the rest of a very exciting webinar and interacting with the audience and, and you all. Thank you so much. Wonderful, Dina. Thank you so much for these reflections. I, 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 I specifically uh, like to highlight this tension that you called out between collecting taxes and poverty alleviation, you know, especially now under COVID-19 and constrained resources, how can governments start to think about this trade-off and where to get the money that they need to to pay their COVID bills? So I'll touch back on this point during our Q&A section, hopefully, but I'd like to pass it on to Jonathan, uh, Gabriel, and Agustan now for them to, to start delving deep into these very exciting research papers. So Jonathan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Uh, thanks very much, Dina, as well. Um, did, I should just mention that Dina's work was very much the inspiration behind uh, sort of what we've been trying to do these past uh, several years in Congo. So it's uh, it's it's a real honor to to follow her in this uh, in this webinar, and um, also just want to reiterate uh, sort of the point she was making at the end. All three of these papers are a deeply collaborative um, enterprise. We've been learning very much from the provincial tax uh, authorities in uh, in the DRC, as as, as we'll discuss more. Um, and are extremely grateful for the chance to have worked with them and learned from them. Uh, and by all means, it's time for the sort of authorship conventions and economics to change. Um, so thanks for, thanks for calling that out, Dina. Okay, I've already made uh, David sort of suffer through the title of my, uh, this, this first uh, paper. So I think I won't repeat it. Um, can I have the next slide, Augustin? So just quickly to step back uh, for a, a second, and, and Dina said much of this more eloquently than I sort of possibly could, but I think, you know, for an audience that's probably concerned with sort of economic development, public policy, you know, what, again, why should we care about taxes? And I think the first point, you know, states need a, a reliable source of financial resources to, to, to enforce contracts, to provide public goods, to, you know, you know correct externalities. I won't say more, kind of Dina, I think, uh, made that you know, very clear. I think there's also uh, evidence that building the tax capacity of the uh, state can also sort of trigger a broader process of state capacity building in other parts, other organs of the state as well, uh, because to collect tax, you need to provide, you need to have a high degree of human capital, you need to have information sort of processed processing capacity uh, in these things historically have spilled over onto other uh, parts of the state. And, and one could hope that a similar process could emerge in low-income countries that tend to have sort of lower capacity states um, at present. And finally, there's reason to believe that uh, investing in the tax capacity of the state could also cause a governance dividend. And here the idea is that taxation doesn't just increase the capacity of the state to do, you know, to implement the policies it wants, it may also increase the accountability of the government, how responsive uh, politicians and sort of agents of the state are to citizens. Um, and so it's this third hypothesis, uh, this third reason to care about, about taxation that we will actually start with in this uh, series of papers. So put differently, the question I'm going to focus on in this first uh, segment is, does taxation increase uh, political participation in what are often called sort of fragile states or low capacity 
States. Um, and as I'll, as I'll explain, this is sort of a, you know, an old hypothesis that exists, um, but we lacked uh, really kind of causally identified evidence, and especially we lacked evidence from a setting like the Democratic Republic of Congo. So this study takes place in the city of Kananga in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, it was this, and, and I'll study the first citywide door-to-door -door property tax collection campaign. The method, as David said, is going to be a randomized evaluation. Um, so studying a door-to-door a, a -door tax collection campaign, and this will be randomized in different neighborhoods of this city uh, of Kanaga to enable a rigorous assessment of the impacts of that campaign on tax revenues, as well as actually per, uh, political participation. So to give you a, a little bit of a preview of where uh, I'm going, this tax campaign did increase tax compliance quite substantially from close to zero ex ante to about 11% uh, 11 of, of citizens. Moreover, it increased those citizens' engagement with the provincial government um, by about five percentage points. Um, so, and that's about a 31% increase relative to the amount of participation in the control neighborhoods. I'll of course give you much more detail about what this campaign is in just a few slides. But to sort of synthesize the policy implications here, uh, the idea is that investing in tax capacity cannot just provide resources to enable states to you know, do the things we need states to do. It can also stimulate the activity of citizens in politics and, and activate them to hold the government to account. Next slide, please. So this participation dividend, put simply, uh, is the idea that taxation can catalyze citizens uh, or into sort of more active agents who, who make demands of the government. And ultimately, that could trigger a, a more a cycle of sort of political accountability. Um, so once citizens are out sort of responding to increases in taxation and, and pressuring the government, making demands for more public goods, more avenues of engagement, more transparency, uh, this could actually lead in the longer run to uh, better quality of government. And so you might think of you know, taxation without representation, the, the slogan of the American Revol uh, Revolution sort of embodies this idea. You might think of tax protests in Kenya, such as the one shown in the photo of the right here, uh, or other, other settings uh, you know about. Uh, next slide, please. So in this, uh, in this project, we're gonna focus on the first link in this chain. Does the state's efforts to expand its tax net in a setting like the Democratic Republic of Congo actually increase the degree to which those citizens are trying to hold the government to account and to engage in political participation? Next slide, please. This, this idea, uh, although as Dina said, we, we sort of didn't have much evidence, especially in sort of low-income countries, policymakers had been suggesting this is indeed the case. So the OECD, for instance, writing uh, tax reforms can enhance accountability between citizens in the state. Or the IMF writing, uh, bringing small businesses into the tax net can help secure their participation in the political process. Um, but, uh, but we didn't really have uh, so much evidence about this. If you look just at the kind of cross section, this is a scatter plot. So on the x axis, we have the tax to GDP ratio. And on the y axis, we have the uh, degree of political participation. Each point is a country. You can see that there is this correlation between countries that collect a lot of tax as a share of their GDP and more uh, participation. But we don't really know if that's a causal relationship. Uh, it could be the case that countries that have more wealth, more education, uh, they may be more likely to have both of these. And my view is that before investing a lot of resources into expanding tax capacity, uh, especially given some of the perhaps troubling distributional implications, the links with poverty reduction, we really want to know if this is a causal relationship and whether that relationship holds in a low income setting like the DRC. Next slide, please. So we study a sort of weak state setting with very low uh, tax compliance. This is Kananga and the DRC. We will be focusing on the provincial government, not the national government. And the revenues in this setting uh, were very low um, in 2015, sort of when we uh, first started uh, working with the provincial government, about 30 cents per person per year, um, per person in the province per year. 
So what did the provincial tax authority decide to do to try to remedy this, this very sort of small amount of uh, tax revenue faced with these sort of massive challenges that Dina was describing? Well, it turned to property tax. And I think that's consistent with a lot of sort of international best practice uh, for local governments. Why? The property tax is thought to be an efficient tax. Um, it's thought it's sort of easy to tax because properties are visible. So it's harder to evade when you're taxing property. It's also, Af you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is the fastest uh, uh, urbanizing continent on the planet. So you have large increases in property values in urban areas that are largely going untaxed. At the same time, as you have increases in demand for urban infrastructure that really ought to be funded from a local tax like the property tax. Yet despite that promise, it's actually the single most underexploited tax in relative terms in low income countries and high income countries. So low income countries are collecting about 0.25% of their GDPs in property tax, and the figure is 10 times that in, in high income countries. So starting in 2016, the government innovated a new uh, approach to collecting property taxes in the form of these door-to-door -door collection campaigns. So the series of three papers that we will be presenting today um, are the result of a, a very close collaboration with the government to study what the, what the government is doing uh, and try to understand you know, how much this is increasing revenue and in, the, in this paper, whether that's having this impact on uh, political participation. Next slide, please. These campaigns, both in 2016 and in 2018, follow a very similar structure. So these tax collectors work in teams of two, and they go to, they're assigned to certain neighborhoods, and in each neighborhood, they conduct two steps. So first, uh, they register all of the properties, because there's no existing property valuation role, so they uh, issue a unique uh, tax ID. And then they return to properties to make in-person tax appeals. They actually solicit payment of the property tax and they collect the, the tax payments right then and there, issuing receipts to taxpayers. And then the government can check if all the payments have been accounted for because this creates a paper trail. Next slide, please. So in what I'll refer to as the control neighborhoods in the context of this first study, you had a, what, was, what was sort of referred to as a declarative system where citizens were supposed to go to the, uh, the bank inside the government and pay the tax themselves. Um, but this really was not enforced among private citizens. There were no visits from tax collectors to people's uh, properties. And so perhaps not surprisingly, tax compliance was near zero. Next slide, please. So the, the 2016 property tax campaign that the government implemented was rolled out in two phases. So in the first phase, it was uh, randomized which neighborhoods the tax collectors would go door to door. And this is the nature of the randomized evaluation that, that I will sort of show you the differences uh, between treatment and control. So the, the red shaded neighborhoods here are the treatment neighborhoods where those tax collectors are going door to door and the unshaded neighborhoods, the tax collectors uh, did not go to door to door in the first phase of this campaign. They rather talked to the old declarative system and then in subsequent campaigns, uh, the tax collectors would go everywhere. And so that randomization lets us look to see, okay, are revenues substantially higher in the red shaded areas compared to the unshaded areas? Are people actually engaging more with the government, demanding more accountability from the government in the red shaded areas compared to the unshaded areas? And because this is randomly assigned, we can be confident that any differences that appear are uh, due to the tax campaign rather than to differences in neighborhood wealth or education levels or other uh, possible uh, differences you may think of. Next slide, please. So first, first, you can see in this graph that uh, if we compare those control neighborhoods to the treatment neighborhoods, there's about uh, there's a 64 percentage point increase in whether the tax collectors were uh, visiting these, these properties. So in other words, the tax collectors were going to the properties um, that the government had assigned them to go to. Uh, next slide, please. And more importantly, this translated into a large increase in Pint of the property tax, so about an 11 percentage point increase from a base of close to zero. So in the declarative system, very few people were paying. 
And once you had door to door collection, uh, that goes up to about 11% of, uh, of, of, of properties that are paying a tax. And this ends up accounting for about 5% of provincial tax revenue. It's a large share for a first time property tax campaign. And this style of tax uh, was indeed continued in subsequent evaluations as my colleagues will, uh, will describe. Next slide, please. To study how this impacts uh, particip political participation, we will look at two ways in which citizens regularly engage with the government in this setting. The first is a series of town hall meetings, which were hosted by the provincial government um, about eight months after tax collection. And citizens in both the treatment neighborhoods and the control neighborhoods both had the opportunities to attend these meetings, uh, but you know, they had to pay for the transport. Uh, they had to take the time out of their busy days to, to do this. So, so looking at whether they chose to do it is in fact uh, indicative of how much demand they have to try to hold the government to account. Um, uh, next slide, please. The other form of participation is um, the uh, whether citizens chose to submit evaluation forms, which were uh, basically providing uh, critiques of the government and uh, offering recommendations to the governor, um, which is again, a form of kind of costly engagement uh, with the government. Next slide, please. So you do see, again, when you just compare the rates of attending the town hall meetings and submitting these evalu government evaluations, there's about a five percentage point increase in the treatment neighborhoods where you had door-to-door -door tax collection compared to the control neighborhoods where you did not. Next slide, please. And if you look at you know, citizens doing both of those activities um, at the same time or you know, just after one another, there's a similar sort of large increase of about 2.7 percentage points. So in short, we do observe um, that taxation is kind of catalyzing citizens to go and try to have a voice in, uh, in the government. Next slide, please. But you might be wondering, well, what are, what are citizens actually doing at these meetings? Are they really sort of holding the government to account? Are they making demands of the government? And so uh, you can see in the, in the distribution of topics of what citizens are asking at these meetings or what they're writing on these evaluations, um, very, it has to do with a process of what I've called here provincial tax bargaining. Uh, so next slide, please. The citizens would, would, would say things like, well, why should the inhabitants of Lukonga pay taxes when the roads are in such a disastrous condition? And I think this is emblematic of this logic of a social contract. Why should I pay tax if the government isn't delivering uh, you know, on, on the sort of you know, hard-earned tax dollars that I'm contributing to it? And so that, that desire to participate and to, to, to make the, hold the government to account is precisely sort of this process that we're interested in. Um, Next slide, please. Some citizens are also um, you know, trying to uh, sort of ask sort of questions about the property tax, not surprisingly. Next slide, please. Some are asking for more transparency over spending. Um, next slide, please. And others are asking for more uh, public goods. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, uh, this, this first study, our first kind of chance to work with the provincial government uh, demonstrated that this system, systematic sort of form of tax collection, extending the tax net, did indeed increase uh, tax revenue. It also sort of fueled citizen participation in the government and, um, and, and citizens, citizen demand, what, what citizens perceive to be the responsibility of the government, which is consistent with this process of building a, for, a sort of stronger social contract. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to pass this uh, to my colleague, uh, Gabriel Turek. Um, who's, who's presenting the, the sort of second, some, some work on the second tax campaign. Uh, thanks, John. Um, so I won't subject you to our pension for long titles uh, here again, but this study focuses on the follow-up 2018 campaign um, in which city chiefs were engaged as tax collectors in addition to state agents. And now um, I'll talk about in detail about what that um, involved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this study follows on to the 2016 campaign that John spoke about in the same setting in Kananga and the DRC, except in this experiment, all neighborhoods received door-to-door -door tax collection. The government adopted this model, um, seeing that it raised revenues in 2016 relative to the old system, but um, had an interest in seeing whether on the margin they could increase compliance even further. And one of the primary focuses was who, what type of actor do you engage in this door-to-door -door tax collection campaign? So state agents raised compliance to about 11% uh, um, in the context of the 2016 campaign, 
the government thought that engaging um, actors outside the state system, who in this context um, are neighborhood chiefs that have authority and responsibilities and are important figures within Kananga, might have the ability to raise revenues even further if they were engaged as uh, tax collectors. Um, and this was an interesting policy question for the government. These chiefs often undertake other duties um, on behalf of the government, such as distributing anti-poverty benefits, and they thought they might be effective in tax collection. Um, it also speaks to some questions of broader external validity and that in, across the world, actors like chiefs and local elites often fulfill these roles, especially in lower income countries. So the experiment here is to again, randomly assign neighborhoods to types of tax collection. In one treatment arm, um, tax collection was done by the same state agents that um, were used in the 2016 campaign, agents of the provincial tax ministry. In the second treatment arm, it's these neighborhood chiefs that are in charge of tax collection. In terms of results, we find first that the local treatment arm collection by neighborhood chiefs increases compliance and revenues by a substantial amount relative to collection by state agents. And um, we do a lot of work um, in the study partnering with the government to implement some um, hybrid treatment arms uh, to shed light on why chiefs are more effective. And we find that it, it seems to be really about the information that these chiefs possess given their um, embeddedness and um, place in the community, they're able to leverage in the act of tax enforcement. However, we also see that chiefs come with some costs. They are slightly more corrupt in, 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 in the sense that they collect more bribes than state agent collectors when in charge of tax collection, which is something that we might expect given they are not agents of the government and it's harder for the government to control them. But we don't observe an erosion of trust in government over the longer run. So delegating this authority outside of the uh, um, provincial government to these actors doesn't seem uh, to cause citizens to believe that the, the government itself is weak, which might undermine um, activities the government undertakes in other settings. So the, the uh, conclusion we take away from this study is that local elites, at least in the short run, can be a source of fiscal capacity in settings like provincial uh, authorities and urban settings in the DRC. Um, but I'll return to this point later on that the, the, this engagement of these actors should not crowd out investments in state capacity over the longer run for several reasons. Um, next slide, please. So I want to briefly touch on the policy issue that motivated this work, and it um, uh, speaks to some of the questions that Dina and John touched on as well of the importance of tax capacity to development. And to go a little bit deeper into this um, question in our context, a decision facing governments in tax collection in these settings where tax collection is still often done on a manual basis and that there's um, individuals who are responsible for enforcing the tax because technologies like TurboTax or emitting taxes through other means don't exist. Um, it depends on like personnel to enforce taxes. The government um, faces a fundamental decision in who to enlist in that task. And we study the comparison of whether it makes sense to enlist your own agents as a government body or to delegate this authority to actors outside the state system. And as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, these actors outside the state system, in our context, these city chiefs, um, are thought to possess better information about citizens potentially, though they come with the downside of being harder to monitor. Um, an additional um, advantage they, they may possess is that they have lower costs of tax collection because they're located in the communities in which they collect, so it's easier for them to travel for tax collection and thus incur lower um, costs uh, of, of um, running a tax campaign essentially. So the research question that we and the government were interested in answering is can a low capacity government like the provincial government in Kananga increased tax revenue by delegating collection to these elites. Why are they more effective? And on the other hand, what costs um, might engaging them come with? Next slide, please. Um, so the experimental design follows the same um, structure as the one John described in the 2016 campaign. Neighborhoods that encompass approximately 50,000 properties citywide were randomly assigned to receive door to door tax collection by a particular collector type. Um, in the first treatment arm, collection was done by these tax ministry agents, and the second collection was done by neighborhood chiefs that are the chiefs that live and work in the neighborhoods in which they would be tasked with tax collection. Everything else is uh, um, pretty much the same as in the 2016 campaign. Collectors registered properties and made door-to-door -door appeals in a second stage of the campaign. And importantly, everything was held constant across the treatments. And this, I think, highlights the importance of partnering with the provincial government here and that we were able to hold the training constant, the protocol the collectors use in taxation, the technology that they use, all that was the same across the treatment. So we could really isolate the effect of the difference in collector identity. We'll rely again on administrative tax data that the government collects built through the technology collectors use, um, as well as collect detailed survey evidence on incidents, bribes, and views of the government. And I wanna briefly highlight the um, 
uh, motivation for applying this strategy to studying this particular question. I think the main advantage of being able to randomize neighborhoods encompassing the entire city to different treatments um, provides a good at scale randomization. That's a true test of policy. The government can really get a sense of whether it makes sense to employ a collector type over another. Whereas in more controlled settings, you might do this in a lab or um, test it on a smaller scale, which might make it more difficult to draw broader conclusions. Though doing it in this way comes with potential challenges of uh, just the logistical challenge of being able to isolate the effect of collector type due to the um, challenges and holding constant everything else across these treatments on a large scale that I mentioned earlier. So I want to highlight here that the partnership with the provincial government is really key in running and it was really key in running this experiment. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So the main results, uh, the headline results are that engaging chiefs in tax collection increases tax compliance by 51% and tax revenues by 44% relative to the central treatment arm in which state agents collected taxes. You can see the figure at right that over the course of the seven month campaign, the chiefs are the blue line here and the state agents are the gray line. Chiefs are uh, in all months more effective at, at raising taxes. But you might also notice that the level of compliance here is overall low. So in the central treatment arm, compliance is around 6%. In the local treatment arm, compliance is around 9 or 10%. So we still have very low levels uh, of compliance overall here. Um, though, as John spoke about, we're really at the beginning stages of tax collection in this setting and that the marginal improvement that chiefs offer is a massive um, improvement on, on the old system. And to benchmark this a little bit more, we compare it to a standard intervention in the public finance literature, a question that Dina has done a lot of work on, um, studying the impact of enforcement messaging, um, which we embed on tax letters in this setting. We do find effects that people respond to information about penalties, they are more likely to pay the tax, but the effect of chiefs collecting taxes is five times larger um, than that intervention. And I'll briefly describe the downsides to chief tax collection, which are an important input when the government goes about thinking how to choose a particular collector type. We do see that chiefs are more corrupt in tax collection. They collect slightly more bribes, though overall it's low, only around 3% of households in the local treatment arm report paying bribes. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't see that views of the government appear to be undermined by engaging chiefs in tax collection. And uh, distributional impacts, which is a, a question that Dina um, brought up in, in her talk uh, of who is ultimately bearing the burden of this tax, which is an important um, uh, part of taxation in the setting, given that not everyone is paying the tax. So if it's the poorest people who end up paying the tax more when chiefs collect taxes, the government might care about that and prefer to choose state agents if they enforce taxes on richer households. But we don't find that to be the case here, that along measures of income and liquidity, we don't see differences across those who ultimately pay. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so then I'll describe the mechanisms um, and how we go about studying uh, these mechanisms. We, so we think that there are three main families of explanations that can explain why chiefs are more effective. The first is that they're putting more effort into tax collection, that they're visiting more properties or visiting them more often, but using survey data on visits reported by households, we don't see any differences across the treatments there. A second explanation is that chiefs have better local information that it can allow them to target visits or choose which households to solicit taxes from. And we test this through a hybrid uh, treatment arm that we call central plus local information or CLI and you can see a picture of this treatment at top right in which the state agent collectors at top and bottom are consulting with the chief from the neighborhood in which those agents are going to collect and the chief is giving those agents information about each, each household and their ability and willingness to comply with the tax and then they use that information when they go to collect. We see that this improves the effectiveness of the state agents when they receive the chief's information, but it doesn't, they don't fully recover the gap with chiefs. So this remaining gap could be consistent with information not being fully transferable, or that chiefs are more persuasive, um, conditional on visiting a household and asking them to pay, the chiefs are better able to convince that person to pay by virtue of their position in the community or what they can threaten the citizen with for non, not complying with the tax. We, this is the third set of explanations um, here, and we don't find strong evidence to support that story. Um, looking at when collect, uh, uh, collectors visit all properties during the initial stage of the campaign, we don't see any significant differences across a uh, collector type, and that's a setting in which the targeting advantage should be neutralized. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so to conclude, this study demonstrates that choosing the type of collector in settings of manual tax collection matter a lot, and that engaging local elites, which are, which are actors that exist outside the state system, can raise revenues significantly, but they also collect more bribes. We find that chiefs are more cost effective. Um, and in the paper, the academic paper that we write, we develop a simple way of putting together these costs from the government's perspective and find that the government would need to weight the cost of this corruption at 15 times the rate they would an additional dollar in 
um, net revenue than uh, in order to prefer employing these state agents over over chiefs um, in conducting taxation in these settings. So we think that this evidence shows that in the short run, at least, governments in fragile and very low capacity settings can benefit from collaborating with such actors, at least in urban and peri-urban settings like ours. Um, I think this is an important input to escaping the um, low equilibrium trap where states have limited revenues from tax compliance, they're unable to provide public goods to a sufficient degree, and they also can't invest in their own fiscal and tax enforcement capacity. And so a first step is raising revenues that can allow the building of the, of the state from, from that initial level. In the longer run, however, we think it's unlikely that engaging chiefs will be a viable path um, in the future uh, as the government develops and the economy develops, especially because uh, sets of third party information that come with economic development, like information about bank accounts, people's um, wages in the formal sector could be used by the state in tax enforcement and that would likely supplant the advantage of chiefs, um, uh, specifically their informational advantages. So finally, we think that chiefs um, collection can be viable in this short run, in the, in the short run in very low capacity settings, but want to stress that it should not crowd out investments in enforcement um, and government capacity in the longer run as states develop. So now I'll hand it over to Augustine to talk about um, the third study. Great. Uh, and so I'll also skip the uh, very long title for our third uh, study here. But basically, uh, the topic of this third study is beyond the identity of the tax collector, what are the other tools governments have to raise their fiscal capacity? And in particular, how uh, should fragile states set their tax rates as well as their uh, enforcement efforts? The context is going to be the same uh, context Gabriel mentioned, the second citywide property tax campaign uh, in Kanonga. Uh, and the method uh, uh, we're going to employ to answer uh, this question is uh, going to be two randomized controlled trials that introduce variation in tax rates through randomized tax abatements and, ran and variation and random variation in enforcement uh, through uh, tax letters and uh, tax collectors. We find two uh, main results. The first one is that uh, tax rates are actually above the revenue maximizing rate uh, in Kananga. In other words, tax revenue go down when tax rates uh, are increased. And in particular, the government would have to uh, lower tax rates by about 34% in order to maximize tax revenue. Why is this the case? Well, uh, as Dina alluded to uh, uh, in, in her uh, introduction, it is due to large tax delinquency response to higher rates. When the government increased tax rates, uh, fewer and fewer people pay the tax. And this effect is so big that it actually leads to a decline in tax revenue. The second key result we find uh, kind of asks the question of, does this mean that governments uh, are condemned to low tax rates and low level of revenue? Well, we find that this is ne not necessarily the case because governments can instead invest in their enforcement capacity to shift up the revenue maximizing tax rate. And why is it the case that uh, investment in enforcement capacity increase the revenue maximizing rate? Well, we find evidence that enforcement is successful at attenuating the tax delinquency response to higher rates uh, that was key uh, in generating the initial drop in revenue at higher rates. In terms of the policy implication of these two results, the, the, the key uh, takeaway in our opinion is that tax rates and enforcement appear to be complementary policy levers. Why, what does it mean? It means that uh, in our view, governments uh, in, in weak states today should uh, increase tax rates in tandem with enforcement rather than considering those as two independent policy levers. The, the key policy issue we are uh, here uh, focusing on is following what Gabriel mentioned, thinking about what are the fundamental decisions that uh, weak states face in order to build their fiscal capacity. Uh, and Gabriel mentioned the identity of the tax collector uh, mattering, but here we focus on other aspects of the tax design, such as tax rates, uh, as well as how the government enforce uh, taxation. The two key research questions uh, this uh, paper uh, aims at answering uh, are first, can a low capacity government uh, generate more tax revenue by increasing tax rates or lowering tax rates? And second, how uh, do response to these tax rate changes uh, interact uh, with the enforcement environment? So starting with the first question and thinking about uh, whether the government should increase or, or lower tax rates in order to uh, increase tax revenue, uh, we answer this question uh, in, in partnership with the government by leveraging the randomization of property tax rate abatements. And so in particular, uh, during the registration phase of the uh, second tax collection campaign that was mentioned both by Jonathan and Gabriel, uh, the government introduced random variation in the amount of the tax liability that property owners faced. 
And this tax liability that was random, randomly assigned was written on the tax letter uh, th that property owners received. Uh, property owners were either uh, assigned to the status quo rate, so they faced the same uh, property tax rate as during the first tax collection campaign, or they were assigned randomly to lower uh, amounts of different magnitude, either 17%, 33%, or 50%. And here I show an example on the left uh, of, of a tax letter for uh, someone assigned to the status quo rate, and on the right, uh, the uh, tax liability for someone assigned to the 50% uh, reduction in tax liability. Uh, and, and the tax rates uh, in Kananga are comparable, so the amount that were mentioned are comparable to uh, uh, real estate tax rates uh, in other developing countries, but also in more developed countries uh, today. So to give you uh, an idea of what it looks like in practice, uh, properties in the control group, irrespective of their property type, so either uh, built in non-durable material on the left or built in durable material on the right, were assigned to the status quo rate that uh, was uh, 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 that applied in the 2016 campaign. Uh, however, uh, some property owners were, uh, were assigned to the treatment groups, were assigned to lower tax liability, uh, and the amount corresponded to either 17% uh, reduction, a 33% reduction, or a 50% reduction. So what, uh, what are the effects uh, of being assigned to a lower tax liability? So this uh, figure on the y-axis shows uh, the percentage of tax compliers, uh, of taxpayers, and on the x-axis, it shows the different treatment group. Uh, and so starting with the control group, people who are assigned to the status quo liability, we see low level of tax compliance, about 5.6% of the property owners paid the property tax uh, when as assigned to the status quo liability. However, what we see is that compliance uh, dramatically increases uh, for property owners who received a tax reduction, so a lower amount. In particular, comparing the status quo liability with a 50% uh, reduction, we see that this 50% reduction increased uh, compliance by more than 100%. And this suggests that uh, what I'm going to show on this next figure is that uh, tax revenue is uh, actually going to go up. So tax revenue is pretty low for uh, the individuals who are assigned to the status quo liability. And so this is uh, property uh, tax, uh, tax revenue per property owner is now on the y-axis. And it actually goes up uh, tax revenue goes up for people who are assigned to a uh, tax reduction, significantly so for the uh, individuals assigned to the 33% uh, reduction or the 50% reduction. And so this uh, uh, first uh, key graph suggests already that tax rates are uh, above the revenue maximizing uh, uh, tax rate in the setting. In other words, lowering rates uh, increases uh, revenue. In the paper, we uh, develop a simple uh, conceptual framework to estimate the revenue maximizing tax rate uh, in our data. And we find consistently uh, with the evidence I've shown you in the previous slide uh, that a 34% reduction uh, in the tax liability would maximize tax revenue. So that's what's shown in this figure. Uh, and so, so far, uh, what this first part of, of this uh, project uh, shows is that when enforcement is low, as is the case in Kananga, tax rate could actually be above the revenue maximizing rate. And so government cannot uh, use their tax rate uh, policy tool uh, uh, to, to simply just increase tax revenue by increasing tax rate. And, and so one conclusion could be, well, governments are condemned to low tax rates uh, and low tax revenue. But we find evidence that there's uh, another alternative, which is that government can invest in their enforcement capacity to uh, shift up the revenue maximizing tax rate. Uh, and in order to show this empirically, we leverage a second randomized intervention uh, that consisted in the random assignment of messages on a property owner's tax letter. Property owners were either uh, assigned to a control message that read paying the property tax uh, is important or to an enforcement message uh, that emphasized sanction for tax delinquency and read if you refuse to pay the property tax, you could be summoned to the tax ministry for investigations and sanctions. Those messages were at the bottom of the uh, tax letters as shown in, uh, in the uh, message above and were read by the uh, tax collector during registration. So the key question is what happens to the revenue maximizing tax rate uh, for each of those uh, groups? And what we see uh, coming back to our previous figure is that Comparing the control uh, group with the treatment group in terms of those messages, uh, the revenue maximizing tax rate uh, is higher for individuals who receive the enforcement message than for individuals who receive the control message. 
And what uh, seems to be uh, happening is that essentially people who receive an enforcement message respond way less uh, to changes in tax liability. Their tax compliance remains high or higher even as the tax rate uh, increases. But the fact that uh, the revenue maximizing tax rate increase with enforcement suggests in terms of policy consequence that tax rates and enforcement are complementary policy levers and that government can uh, generate more tax revenue if they uh, focus on both of those tools together rather than independently. And to give a sense of uh, the revenue uh, implication of this complementarity, we look at uh, revenue curves, which is essentially now on the y-axis tax revenue per property owner and on the x-axis tax rate. So it's essentially mapping how does government tax revenue vary at different tax rate. And we do so in blue at the status quo level of enforcement and in red at a higher level of enforcement that correspond to having received an enforcement message. This allows us to compare two types of government, a government that uh, takes tax rate uh, and enforcement as independent policy levers and adjusts them separately. For example, it proceeds sequentially, it sets tax rate at the revenue maximizing rate, and then in a in next time period, increase enforcement. And we see that this policy path would increase tax revenue by about 61%. However, we can contrast it with what a government could, can achieve if it instead takes into account the complementarity between tax rates and enforcement and adjusts them jointly. In particular, that government would realize that the revenue maximizing tax rate has now increased at a higher level of enforcement. And if it sets this new revenue maximizing tax rate, we see that the total policy uh, path uh, of, of change in enforcement and tax rate would lead to a 77% increase in revenue instead of the initial 61% uh, increase. So to uh, wrap up on this uh, third uh, project, uh, we, we think there's two uh, uh, implications. The first one is that potentially low state capacity can impose on ceiling on tax rate. And so governments are potentially constrained in very weak states in terms of the tax rate that they can set uh, in order to increase tax revenue. And in particular, in our uh, very low capacity setting, we find that increasing tax rates can actually uh, result in lower tax revenues. However, uh, we don't think that this means that states are, are condemned to low tax rates and low revenue. We find evidence that uh, investment in enforcement capacity can increase uh, the tax rate that governments can afford. Uh, and in other words, this suggests that tax rates and enforcement are complementary policy levers. And this has important uh, uh, consequence for uh, the revenue implication of tax collection. So taking that complementarity into account is important uh, if the government wants to uh, raise our revenue. And so to kind of take stock on, on, the, three, uh, on the three studies, uh, we, we focused on three aspects of, uh, of building fiscal capacity uh, in weak states. Uh, Jonathan uh, showed evidence that uh, when the government uh, does effort to extend the tax net, it can lead to uh, uh, increased engagement uh, with the formal state uh, and potentially uh, strengthen the, the social contract. Uh, uh, Gabriel Dell uh, uh, focused on the type of policy levers uh, governments have in order to raise a revenue and focused on one aspect in particular, which is the identity of the tax collector that are uh, collecting taxes uh, and show evidence that collaboration with a uh, local elite can be successful at uh, raising tax compliance, uh, uh, especially uh, due to their local information and that it doesn't necessarily uh, lead to uh, excessive bribe taking or backlash uh, against the formal state, which might be a concern when empowering such elites to collect taxes. Uh, and finally, the third uh, study showed uh, evidence of other policy tools governments can use to uh, raise revenue, uh, in particular tax rates and enforcement, uh, and finds that they are likely to be complementary uh, policy levers uh, in uh, such settings. Uh, and we think kind of uh, even broader picture and echoing what Dina mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this suggests that it's really important, those, those questions really benefited from uh, a, a long-lasting uh, long lasting uh, collaboration uh, with the uh, Provincial Tax uh, Authority and Casai Central, uh, and we would not have been uh, able to, to, to study those questions without their constant uh, guidance and support, uh, but we think it's really important uh, that uh, there's more research that's done in, in collaboration uh, with tax authorities uh, and in developing countries in particular in, in, in order to understand fundamental aspects about building fiscal capacity uh, in, in weak states. Uh, so thanks uh, everyone um, for, for uh, all this. Ostan, thank you very much. And Jonathan, Gabriel as well. These are extremely important insights and 
uh, it's quite interesting to see how how very close collaboration with the, the, the DRC regional and local governments in this case allows you to, to come up with these insights. So we'll touch upon this in the Q&A. We received quite a few questions. Uh, keep them coming in. Thank you so much to the members of the audience, but we want to make sure uh, to pass it on to our next and final speaker, Marina. Uh, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much for uh, to the organizers to, for putting together this great uh, meeting. And it's an honor for me to be discussing um, kind of the concluding uh, remarks on the, these uh, wonderful papers. Um, first of all, as uh, Dina has mentioned earlier, these uh, papers are really, I've really enjoyed reading them as they uh, have put together very careful research design and implementation, uh, which really nicely accounted for the local context and uh, also discussed clearly the mechanisms underlying the, the findings. And more importantly, a very rich uh, set of insightful results that are very relevant um, in the context of policy in DRC and I'm sure for many uh, country, similar economies. So speaking to these uh, policy relevance, there is a one very uh, important um, uh, political and administrative shock change that has had happened in DRC is uh, established by the constitution in 2006, but which was implemented later since 2015, which kind of consec consecrates the decentralization of the, the country where uh, think of it as a transfer of uh, power from the central to local entities, and which also uh, later uh, led to the, the, split, the split of the country from 11 to 16. 26 provinces. So this has had uh, a very huge uh, public finance implications because uh, first of all, there is now a clear distinction between the central and provincial government resources as well as uh, spending responsibilities. And at the same time, uh, there is now, for example, the the central government that can still collect uh, a very precise set of taxes, uh, both at the national and the local level, but uh, the provincial governments are left with a very small, uh, a smaller set of taxes that they can um, uh, play with, and this includes the property tax, the rental tax, and a few other uh, direct taxes, and uh, another, another set of uh, sector-specific taxes. So this really creates some differences because the provinces are different in their endowment. Um, for example, for the mining, where some provinces would be uh, uh, collecting taxes more easily than others. But for most provinces, they were uh, mostly forced to start building their own tax collection capacity. So this set of researchers uh, uh, papers are really a unique opportunity to learn about this fiscal uh, state capacity building and uh, the context in DRC is really perfect for that. Um, and then the question I would like to address is how uh, these results can be interpreted and applied. I think uh, Augustin just, uh, really nicely laid out uh, the main findings across the papers. So I would like to just discuss some uh, important uh, policy design ingredients that one could learn from this uh, very successful property tax collection campaign that happened in uh, Kananga as it uh, uh, was shown to have increased compliance and tax revenues. So first there, is, there are just uh, key uh, policy design ingredients related to the tax uh, administrative capacity for property tax collection. As uh, we've, uh, I've said earlier, this is kind of a, a very, uh, one of the ways that the, the provincial government could start collecting uh, their own resources is by implementing this tax collection. But there are interesting uh, details about it that uh, uh, one would uh, want to carefully think about when it comes to implementing, uh, designing a tax pro property tax collection. So first there is, uh, for example, the property valuation methods, which happened during uh, the, the first phase of the property tax collection campaign, which was called the registration, just thinking about what ways uh, the government could uh, um, 
uh, evaluate, evaluate these uh, properties would be important. There are, uh, the, 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 this policy also uh, relied on uh, digitization of the payment receipts that one can also think about. And uh, there is a question about what to tax. Uh, it's, it can be important because it's of course uh, um, uh, properly taxed, but uh, there is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, there are reasons to think about what to actually tax, whether it's just the land or the actual compounds of the, of the, the, the property. These are exactly also other questions to account for. And there's also the uh, exemptions that, uh, for example, the local elites paper has mentioned where the chiefs would um, take some decisions to exempt. So when it comes to this, to, to designing the tax policy, it's important to, for example, think about whether there is uh, any uh, unnecessary, whether the exemptions are possibly unnecessarily complexifying the system. On top of that, the first paper discussed the uh, kind of the uh, uh, participation dividends to um, uh, collecting tax revenues. So this leads to really thinking about uh, ways to improving or to, to um, uh, uh, favoring collaboration between these informal and formal democratic institutions because in Kananga, there's uh, these uh, nice town hall meetings happening. So it's nice that uh, for a place where uh, a government is trying to think about these policies to think how this collaboration collaboration can be um, uh, uh, further um, uh, implemented. There has also been uh, uh, results on how uh, investing in enforcement capacity has good returns. So in terms of uh, designing a policy, this points to the importance of uh, a good screening and uh, a good training of tax collectors because this could uh, really help in uh, um, uh, ensuring good tax uh, performance as they go to collect these, uh, these uh, revenues. Uh, the papers of also have shown the, the good benefits of enforcement layers. So both these results are also pointing to kind of the weaknesses of the current declarative system for the context of DRC and many other countries. So information alone may not be enough to collect these taxes. So it's great to invest in uh, enforcement capacity. Uh, further, the result was also pointing to uh, the importance of really carefully designing the tax rates uh, itself. So for the case of DRC, the tax rate uh, on property tax um, is, uh, has shown, was shown to be very high. So it's really important as an, it is a, a policy design ingredient to think carefully about what tax uh, rate should be uh, implemented because these, are, these have uh, uh, welfare implications as well given the liquidity constraints in, uh, in the low revenue context. And uh, finally, uh, uh, the third paper has, uh, the second paper in the, in the uh, order today has uh, discussed the importance of incorporating local elites as uh, tax collectors into the former state, at least for the short run. But it's nice that uh, in the context of decentralization, for example, in DRC or other countries that has uh, the same political and administrative system, that uh, this, this decentralization is kind of offering, uh, conferring a formal status to these uh, 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 chiefs. So I'll come back to it later. But when thinking about the uh, implementation, it might be interesting to uh, um, think carefully about the incentives that uh, could also matter when uh, um, uh, allocating this task to local uh, elites to collect taxes. So some of the key follow-up questions that might be of interest for policymakers in DRC or other similar uh, tax environment, uh, low tax environment that could also uh, maybe benefit from uh, additional evidence. I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about some uh, possible policy uh, complementarities. Uh, the question is, uh, to what extent other barriers could undermine the benefits from these interventions? So put in different ways, it's uh, uh, what kind of other policy um, uh, reforms could really help 
the uh, and complement the efforts that are going on for uh, improving tax collection uh, capacity. So first is, for example, the land policy. So a poor property tax system can pose real challenges, even for the registration that uh, uh, um, would further uh, uh, pose challenges in tax collection capacity. So for the case of DRC, for example, the property conflicts are kind of a leading cause of the conflicts in courts in DRC. Some sources point to about 80% of the conflicts in courts are about land in places like Kinshasa. And this includes cases like uh, of inheritance conflicts or fraudulent property uh, documents. So thinking about how improving uh, the land uh, policy could further uh, strengthen the uh, local capacity to collect taxes, for example, the property tax could be uh, interesting to know about. There's also the financial system. Um, one could think about the way it can help into uh, increasing enforcement capacity by offering to the state or the province more uh, tools for sanction. And uh, even if uh, the sanction could be not uh, always um, applied, but at least that could uh, uh, contribute to, to uh, the citizens' belief about the probability of sanction in case of uh, uh, tax delinquency. And this could also further uh, help in improving access to information or minimize corruption has, that has been shown in uh, some of the descriptive studies about bancarisation that uh, recently happened in the DRC. And just in general, thinking about some uh, kind of practical or equitable sanction tools that uh, could benefit the government um, or the provincial government when uh, thinking about enforcement. Could, uh, these could be questions that uh, future research could benefit from uh, uh, on the policy side. Uh, another aspect I wanted to, to point to is, uh, again, back to the decentralization is, um, at least on paper, the, there is potential to leverage central state capacity and use the central re, uh, resources provision. Because the, although the provinces are given some of these uh, uh, direct taxes that they can uh, uh, raise and also decide on how to spend them, there is still provision on the state's uh, uh, um, uh, taxes that they raise at the local level, which uh, they have about 40% of which can should be uh, paid back to the provinces. So, so far, the, because the decentralization is also still ongoing, there have, uh, most of the provinces have not been benefiting from that. So it might be due to the lack of administrative capacity. So conditioning on that working, um, it might be, uh, one can raise the question to know how, uh, uh, whether there could be any conflicting interest in raising uh, taxes, central versus local taxes at the provincial level. So on the remaining time, I, I want to um, comment, provide like one comment for each of the, the research paper on in terms of uh, what uh, we could also learn as a follow-up uh, uh, question uh, looking at the, the policy implications. So first of all, on the, the um, um, dividends paper, participation dividend paper. So there was one very interesting uh, 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 policy implication, or at least uh, one uh, conclusion that had us to better understand why uh, some governments, as the literature points to, would choose to rely on less visible taxes because they, because of the evidence, for example, the one that we see in this paper, that uh, visible taxes would uh, uh, more likely lead uh, to a participation dividend. So one question would be to, uh, to trying to understand in this context of uh, a limited set of local taxes, which are mostly direct taxes, uh, what would we learn in the longer run? So ideally, the participation dividend would lead to an increased provision of public goods, but what if that doesn't happen? Then what could we learn uh, in the longer run as the government tries to implement uh, these types of policy? Uh, how, what could we learn about this uh, uh, set of uh, 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 results regarding political participation and just the beliefs and perceptions of the citizens. 
the reason why uh, this question might be interesting is that in across the country in some of the major cities there are uh, at least anecdotal evidence of uh, places where you would see the government still trying to enforce uh, uh, the collection of uh, taxes for which there is uh, still less no visible investment in public goods. So it would be interesting to kind of understand what could be the mechanisms that could uh, sustain such situations. And then uh, finally, uh, who is, is there a, a space where one can uh, see different um, uh, political participation dividend across different tax uh, types or tax periods? And looking at the, the, um, the second paper on uh, uh, tax ceilings, one of the great uh, implication or discussion in the paper was about uh, welfare implication and uh, uh, that actually if the government is trying to target welfare then they want they would lower the tax rates even even more uh, compared as compared to the revenue maximizing tax rates so one question is how the, the renters could be impacted like if we want to think about the way for maximizing tax rate, then uh, uh, should we also think about the renters because they would uh, uh, be part of the same kind of assets. And in Kananga, about 23% of the, the properties have uh, at least one renter. Uh, so that could be higher in other, other cities. And uh, these renters already face uh, a rental tax. And uh, one could think of a situation where the rental owner would transfer this cost to renters and then uh, accounting for that could maybe uh, uh, lead to thinking about even lowering the tax rate even further down. And finally, on the local tax, uh, local elite is tax collectors, as I pointed earlier, there is this uh, interesting uh, uh, setting in DRC that of uh, decentralization that actually confers uh, 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 a formal status to the local chiefs, for example, the chef du quartier to, 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 um, to uh, fulfill a set of tasks. So, Although there is a, a great discussion in the paper about uh, uh, why in the longer run, uh, it's really important to think about uh, not uh, substituting uh, uh, the use of local elites with uh, the central government in investment, would uh, the political and administrative organization that like in DRC favor uh, the use of local elites for, for a longer term because of uh, kind of this uh, status that, are, that is uh, offered to them. Uh, uh, thanks to the uh, centralization. So uh, I, I just wanted to point to two other uh, elements that uh, were raised from the, the Ministry of Finance on other current strategies uh, that uh, the states in DRC has been trying to to apply to broaden tax base and uh, to improve compliance, um, which could possibly also benefit from uh, uh, evidence. One is uh, how to capture the informal sector. The government is trying, has been trying to, for example, to incentivize the formality by lowering the entry costs. And they've also been uh, uh, thinking about the firms as taxpayers, um, how uh, a, a better distribution of tax rates across, across sectors could uh, could help uh, following the results, for example, on the tax ceilings paper and uh, how to further simplify the tax system. So I uh, just wanted to point to, to these other uh, uh, questions that uh, the government in DRC have been thinking about that could uh, also benefit from further uh, evidence. Um, I think I'm uh, uh, short in time. The very last uh, slide was just uh, a little bit out of the subject because it's uh, beyond the tax collection because we're talking about uh, uh, very early states of uh, early stages of uh, um, uh, tax of uh, state formation, how one could think about uh, translating the uh, um, improved tax collection capacity into better uh, uh, tax, uh, better uh, provision of, uh, of public goods. Um, thank you.
Marina, thank you so much for these insights and, and rooted in, in within the DRC context to get an even richer understanding of uh, how these findings can be applied and what remaining questions are left. Uh, I just want to note that we are four minutes uh, away from concluding the webinar. We will conclude it within four minutes, but we have so many great questions that we'd love to uh, extend uh, the time for an additional 15 minutes after this conclusion. So for those of you in the audience that are interested in staying until 115 Eastern, so about 20 minutes from now, uh, please do so since we'll, that way we will have the chance to answer more questions. But there's there's one question that we wanted to kind of make sure that um, all members of, 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 of our panel today had the chance of addressing. Um, and that question is, uh, you know, if there are any policymakers or people in charge of some sort of policymaking in the audience with us today, either from the DRC, from a very similar place to the DRC or from another low or middle income country, that are looking to build their state's capacity for tax collection. What is the main message or the main recommendation you would like them to take away from this discussion? So if each of the speakers could just take about 30 seconds to provide your, your one tagline recommendation, um, it can be related to the COVID context that we're living in now as well or not, um, that would be great. So we can start perhaps in the order that we went with. Uh, Dina, if you would like to jump in with any thoughts or uh, any reflections. I would be more interested in hearing from the policy people in the audience what they think they could use. I'm not sure I can tell them uh, how to do their job, but um, uh, I guess the one thing I could say is it could be exciting to work with academic researchers. You get free uh, additional workers to help you analyze what works. So um, if you're interested in that, reach out to any of the panelists. I think uh, they could be exciting collaborations. Definitely. Jonathan, uh, Gabriel, Augustan, any thoughts or reflections? Yeah, thanks, David. <laughs> I think um, I think one, one thing I would highlight is uh, just it, sort of thinking about Dina's initial opening about how, you know, this is really hard work uh, <laughs> for the tax authorities to do. And I, I guess, you know, by working very closely with them, we've observed these the scale of these challenges, and they are just immense. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, you know there's just growing support, sort of on the on the technology side, and sort of you know I, there there's I, I I really think it's um, you know it's it's uh, yeah many of us are willing are very excited to 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 try to learn how we can you know um, you know, play some role in studying and, and trying to provide further evidence. So, um, yeah, I guess that's that's what I would I would try to say to, to synthesize everything. But <laughs> yeah, I guess the main conclusion that I have from our work is that each context is different, and each government's priorities at the moment are different. And so, finding the right tax solution really depends on the challenges and facing governments and what they're interested in solving, what problems they're interested in solving, and how tax can help. Them in our setting, it's about raising the initial level of tax compliance to a higher level so the government can start building state capacity. In other settings, it might be more important, like some of the uh, issues uh, Marina brought up, thinking about how the like interaction between welfare and taxation um, and how important that is to the government if taxes are really borne by like high net worth individuals and enforcement might be the right solution there, whereas in another setting, it might be the opposite. So I think context-based solutions is the, like, the main takeaway that I, I've taken from our work. Yeah, and I think to echo what uh, Gabriel was saying, I think one like one takeaway is that, for example, the the revenue maximizing tax rate might not be always constant. That as the government builds its fiscal capacity, uh, you know, they might want to revise uh, the tax rate that they can set. Similarly, we can think that as the state builds its fiscal capacity, relying on local elite will be more or less important. So. The fact that we can kind of study all this uh, different responses at different level of enforcement, I think, is, is 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 very exciting. But I do think there's also, you know, we we would like to be able to study different, uh, even more different context, uh, and that's where policy uh, partners are key. And so I echo what uh, Dina mentioned that uh, we'd love to hear, and and all the project we've seen, uh, you know, where a, a great majority of them came from the government's initial kind of puzzle or 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 initial uh, you know question about can we do this and you know should we do this and 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 so that's where we would benefit most so um, I, I agree with that uh, takeaway as well Marina, any any reflections on this 
Um, I would say the as everyone has uh, mentioned, um, the issues are complex because uh, of um, many components um, of uh, difficulties happening at the same time. And uh, um, it's really nice to see all this research coming up and into in the way they of the collaboration that uh, helps into really uh, highlighting the like putting it clear in uh, in the tax policies tax policy makers mind about uh, the interrelations between these uh, these components so yeah it's it's really challenging but it's really great uh, this uh, research is coming up and uh, helping a lot in in highlighting and helping us understand the um, uh, how to build safe capacity, fiscal safety. Thank you so much, Marina. And uh, we'll, we'll formally let all attendees who have to jump off now to do so. Uh, for those of you who are interested in staying an additional 15 minutes, we'll answer some of the questions that we've received. I will be selfish and ask one additional question of my own. Um, and I want to direct this to you, Marina, given how uh, you've, you've been ingrained in this context and uh, how you keep underlining you know, how, how challenging this can be. Um, and my, my question is, you know, given that this research resulted in some concrete policy recommendations to the Kasai Central, to the Kananga government, but it, it, can, it can be quite a challenge to get policymakers to apply and adopt these recommendations and for future policymakers to keep implementing these recommendations in practice. Based on any experience that you might have had working within government in the DRC, based on your academic experience, what do you see as some of the main challenges behind getting policymakers to actually apply some of these recommendations in practice. Yeah, so um, really the application of the, the policy recommendations, again, speak to the, the systemic uh, con con um, aspect of, of it. So we are thinking about uh, tax policy as uh, mentioned, but uh, this might be related to other might be related to the land policy, which is being conducted uh, by different uh, sets of actors, just getting to collaborate across uh, the different um, sectors in the in the in the government is not always uh, easy. So collaborating and uh, coming together to implement policies that are um, uh, um, Harmonious across sectors is is one one big challenge that I've uh, also witnessed and um, and uh, in in, uh, in policy implementation in DRC and besides that uh, which is really very related it's the 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 repeated change in actors which uh, um, come with different ways of trying to implement uh, policies and. Uh, uh, really affects the the speed in which uh, a, a set of policies can be implemented. So these are what two two challenges that I can think of, um, like the system and also the actors and uh, the constant change in in actors um, to implement these policies. Absolutely, and it's 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 common, I think, in all of JPL and IPAs and your own uh, work with, with many governments in these settings. I wanted to ask you if there's any solutions to these challenges, but I, I recognize that. Uh, you know, that's kind of the, the, the burning question, right? And what we're trying to do every day is, is, is all of those types of challenges. Um, I did want to highlight one early question from the audience from an anonymous attendee from Nepal. That is, what types of taxation strategies should be applied during this COVID situation? So going back to the original point kind of that I, that I highlighted from Dina's presentation, um, COVID-19 has heightened this need for both increased government revenues to cover the cost of the COVID bill but also the need to safeguard citizens' income and avoid steep increases in their cost of living. So are there any you know, strategies from the papers discussed today or, or other strategies based on your experience uh, as, as academics um, that would be particularly handy during a, a COVID-19 context? Um, and this is open to, to all panelists, um, but perhaps we, can, we could start with, with, with Dina, if you don't mind, given that this is something that we brought up in your part of the presentation too. Well, I, I think I brought it up because I don't know how to answer it. And I think we should think about it more. I, I would love to know if anyone in the audience has thoughts on it, or has experience with it. But um, yeah, I think uh, we, we should. I, I haven't thought enough about it. And I think I want to think about it more, is I guess my 
position. Just that yeah. it's very important. <laughs> I could, I could, I could say one thing, which is that I think we've, you know, we've seen um, at least within countries that often the impact of COVID is heterogeneous, and you know, the uh, rich families have access to care and, and things that poor families do not. And my opinion is that this should be sort of observed and noted by governments as further reason to increase the progressiveness of taxation. Uh, the progressivity of, of tax rates. Um, this is something that sort of historically the evolution of progressivity as some uh, great work in political science has, has sort of pointed out, has moved hand in hand as, you know, with, with sort of the world wars, when again, kind of the, the, the need to, to serve fell upon sort of low, lower income households more than higher income households. And so a progressive tax schedule to raise revenue was the only sort of ethic, morally justifiable thing. And I think the, the pandemic uh, could, could lead to a very similar argument and government should seize this opportunity to increase the progressivity of, uh, of taxation. And that's actually something we're, we're sort of uh, observing like the provincial government, that's one of, it, one of the main things it wants to do in the coming uh, phase is to adopt a more progressive uh, property tax uh, schedule. I can't say it's caused by COVID, but I, I think it's, um, I think broadly it fits into, uh, you know, a potentially an important trend. I think I feel similarly to Dina that it's a really difficult question that we don't have great answers to now, but I think taking like a bigger picture view of the importance of taxation to state capacity. Um, we observe in, at least in Africa, states with stronger capacity like Rwanda and South Africa mounted like more robust responses to COVID. And I think that at least goes to show in some part that taxation, building tax capacity now is important for encountering future challenges in the long run, hopefully not future pandemics, but that a stronger state built through greater tax and other forms of state capacity can allow you to address challenges like COVID more effectively. And so that's another reason why building this capacity in low income settings now is really important and like important to many other and many other dimensions. And I think echoing both Dina and, and, and Jonathan, uh, the idea that uh, that the government can more effectively potentially tax by, you know, thinking harder about the exemption margin that Marina mentioned, shielding away more of the of the poorest citizen and increasing its effort towards the the the, the richer uh, citizen who are very hard to tax uh, uh, in 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 you know most uh, low capacity setting uh, is something important. So it can happen through the slope of the the tax schedule, having more progressivity, but also thinking about other levers. So the exemption, as I think, is important, uh, and and then like where do you allocate effort, uh, and and how do you mobilize. Uh, um, you know, wealthier property owners to pay. And I think this also echoes to this idea of, of uh, increasing participation and, uh, you know, citizens are more likely to hold a, a, a government accountable to think the tax is fair if they see that the richest are paying. If they see that it's not the case, then it's very hard uh, to imagine that, uh, you know, that it's, it's very sustainable. So I do think there's many tools and like uh, all of them should be thought about carefully. And I, I think there's a lot of open question. I, I echo Dina on, on the fact that it raises question that we don't have, and we're we're very much uh, excited to hear what you know the government in Kasai Central, but in other contexts, have to say about this, uh, and and how we can learn from that. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to highlight a question from the audience from Anusha Sridhar, that is, what are the alternatives to tax collection more generally, especially in the background of other means of funding such as impact investment. So today we've talked about you know, how the identity of the tax collector might matter, how the enforcement ability might matter, what happens with participation, but it's all still kind of been on the, on the, on the assumption that we, we still have to go out and collect taxes. Uh, are there alternatives? Is, can things like impact investments substitute taxes entirely in, in these types of settings? Feel free, any, any one of you that has any reflections to jump in. I mean, as I guess I could say a couple of things. One is that, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I think certain things are really the function of the state. Now, one can debate what's the right size of the state. Uh, in, in rich countries, there's lots of political debates, but in a place like the Democratic Republic of Congo, it's clear that the state is just really, really tiny and lots of problems ensue from that. So I don't think that 
impact investing can replace the state. Um, but you know, there might be libertarians who would disagree with me on that, but most people would probably see that in that, in that situation that the state is too small. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the country can't benefit from other financial flows that I also had in my slides, like remittances from migrants abroad are playing a very important role in also building capacity uh, in the DRC. And um, that there could be foreign uh, investments, including uh, impact investing. But I think it's complementary, not necessarily a substitute. Wonderful. Any any other reflections from any other panelists? I guess I could just quickly say there is, I think, uh, good evidence also that um, there's something of a political resource curse. So if you're maybe not impact investing, but an obvious alternative would be sort of natural resources. But um, there's, I think, there is growing evidence that. Um, pot potentially you can view this on the flip side of the first study uh, that I spoke about, you know, in the absence of taxation creating a kind of bond, a citizen um, state social contract, citizens are, are less engaged with politics and therefore ultimately the quality of governance is lower. Um, and there's a number of, of studies uh, using different methodologies that, that seem to suggest that finding. A really important political economy consideration uh, to, to bring up and highlight. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I selfishly have, have one last question, and this might be uh, the, the final question that we ask. And thank you all for uh, answering via the Q&A directly via text. Um, if you have remaining questions, you can always reach out to us and, and you know, we, we, can, we can get in touch with the panelists too. Uh, but my question is aimed at uh, Jonathan, Gabriel, and Augustan, your work uh, in the DRC. These insights are, are quite rooted in the local context. You know, you even went as far as estimating a specific revenue maximizing tax rate in Kananga, suggesting policy recommendations based on this rate. Um, how should governments and organizations that work in other contexts interpret these findings? You know, do they now have to go and run their own contextual RCTs to determine what their own tax maximizing tax rate is? Um, or are there any like gen generalizable and underlying findings that um, they can take into account even if their context doesn't quite look like the DRC or like Kananga. I guess I can, I can take a first stab and uh, pass it off. Um, I guess it's a great question, David. I, I think um, certainly we've, as Gabe just sort of emphasized, we, we think this is all very locally sort of contextually specific. So we wouldn't want to overclaim about, you know, where uh, some of these results have generalizability, although most likely it would be similarly kind of uh, lower capacity states um, that are collecting, you know, around 10% of their GDPs in tax or less. Um, one, I mean, I, I think it's, this is a very important set of countries that are often the, the greatest challenges in uh, development today are clustered increasingly uh, in what are known as fragile states often. Uh, and it's estimated that in the next 10 years, um, you know, the, the majority of the extreme poor will be clustered in these, uh, in these settings. I think it is an important, even though the generalizability may be you know, limited to a set of something like 30 countries, um, I think those are very important countries to, to study. Um, one, I mean, I think maybe perhaps uh, Gabe and Augustine can speak to sort of the, the, the details of the second uh, to two papers we studied, um, I guess just a, just another pitch for the, the ways in which governments can uh, rigorously study uh, their their policies. No, I don't think we need RCTs always, uh, but there's many other forms of evaluations that can be done. Um, you know, uh, lots of the administrative work, administrative data work that Tina you know, sort of mentioned briefly in the beginning uh, has not leveraged RCTs, but you can com come up with quasi-experimental designs and really kind of have uh, very credible uh, assessments of the causal impact of policies. So I don't think every government needs to run RCTs, although often there will be occasions when they can, including sort of phased rollouts of policies, such as some of the ones we studied. Uh, but I think there is a real need for sort of continued evidence-based um, policymaking, which can leverage all, all types of data collection. And I can speak specifically to the study I spoke about, um, studying the engagement of chiefs in tax collection. I think um, one thing we discovered in like learning about our context and how the, the importance of this question in Kanango was observing the importance of these similar actors in other settings. There's been some work in Southeast Asia, for example, of the role of local elites in on the other side of the fiscal equation and distributing anti-poverty benefits. 
um, and that these actors exist in many low capacity states, filling gaps that the state cannot or doesn't provide. Um, and I think depending on uh, what that context looks like and the mechanisms that might be at work, whether those agents like those elites possess information, I think that would really determine the external validity of um, whether you could expect that the, they would possess the same characteristics that we observe in our settings and the same forces would be at work would sort of constrain uh, the external validity. And I think coming back to the point that it really it's about the context of uh, the relationships between those actors and what role those actors are playing um, sort of conditions the external validity. And I think likewise, thinking about the, the study I presented, what we were struck by was uh, stepping back from our results and looking at how, how the relationship between tax rates today uh, uh, maps with variation in, in government's enforcement capacity. Our study suggests that because they're complements, you, you should see a positive relationship, but it's actually surprisingly flat. Uh, and so, you know, low capacity states tend to set their tax rate the same way as middle income countries and the same way as like richer countries. And, 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 you know, I think what's important is that what, what is at the origin of, of this is also, you know, the type of, I think it echoes some, some concern that Dina mentioned earlier about representative and who gives advice to governments and potentially, you know, experts that are not representative that don't know the context will recommend to apply the same tool, you should increase tax rate to get more revenue. But if you don't consult with the authority and you don't, you know, uh, uh, have, have a sense of, of the local setting, you might get the policy recommendation wrong. And that's something we kind of, our results uh, suggest. And I, and I think this is the same way as uh, empowering local elites. If you ask an expert, they might say, well, we should actually centralize, we should formalize rather than implementing local elite. And, and, uh, and quite frankly, all those topics came from discussion with the government where they were suggesting, you know, maybe the tax rate is off, maybe we should empower those uh, 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 local elites uh, uh, that have been useful in other contexts. And so I think that that is, I think, uh, important uh, to me. Uh, and I take away from all our studies uh, jointly. Wonderful. Well, I, I'm fascinated by these responses. I, I, I could go uh, on all day. There's many great questions left. So apologies to the audience members that we couldn't get to answering your questions. But we, we'd like to wrap up now. We're way over time. Thank you so much once again, Dina, Jonathan, Augustan, Gabriel, Marina the IPA and JPL teams and the audience. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you can always look at our websites, reach out to us, read through the studies that my colleagues linked to in the chat and stay tuned for more information about our next webinars in this series.